stick with cars then and just use an example as a kind of illustrate what you're saying because cars seems to be a master at this illusion of creating lies, misleading <laughs> stories. So just maybe give us one example of how car does it and what do you what he tells audiences and what his goal is. I mean, yeah, so Carr is a really interesting figure and he's been celebrated at times as an industrialist and it, and he is an industrialist, uh, what we might call today as a job creator, right? Um, and uh, and he does, he creates jobs, many of them low paying uh, jobs in his mills and, and he makes fabulous amounts of wealth on this. Well, at the same time, he is pushing um, a conservative political agenda. He's a member of the conservative Democratic Party at the time and he's pushing a a white supremacist agenda. And so he's very clear on how he views the world and the world the world should be ordered. And he views this narrative of history as a means to get that. And I think a lot of the sc earlier scholars who've looked at this have sort of neglected to think about him in the proper context of sort of what he's doing with his money. He's not just creating jobs, he's using it for power. He's buying newspapers that are then used to push white supremacy. He's buying newspapers so he can run for office. Now he, fa he fails to win his Senate campaign in 1900, but largely because he's not extreme enough. He's not racist enough to win, right? And so um, I think one of my favorite examples of, of Carr lying is he, he goes to an audience that's African-American. He's at an African-American uh, school that he'd given money to, um, right? And so he would give money to African-American schools. Now, here's the catch. Those schools then are beholden to him and they're beholden to him because of the very same policies he pushed that defunded African-American schools, right? Because there is no public money coming in. They're dependent on private donations, which he provides, provided they teach certain curriculum. So he's not offering them money so they can teach the liberal arts. He's offering them money so they can teach how to grow cotton, how to work in a mill, right? It's a very specific set. He's giving loans to African-American businesses that he's gonna make a profit on, right? Money matters to him, of course. Um, and so it's not out of the goodness of his heart. It's out of an agenda in some ways because then he goes to this, give this speech at Biddle University uh, in which he tells these graduates who have just spent their you know, four years studying their butts off, have learned the history. They know what the war was about. And he tells them that, you know, they need to listen to his version of history or else. And it's an explicit threat to them. He says, you need to stop telling Northerners they need to give you money because relations are bad in the South, because relations are good in the South, do you understand? And as long as you say relations are good in the South, no one's gonna hurt you. Which the, of course, the implied thing is, if you keep saying this, someone will hurt you, right? And he says, we don't need to go talk about what caused the war. He doesn't even wanna talk about it that way. Though this is one of the few times he will acknowledge um, slavery, and I'll explain that in a second. Uh, we don't even talk about that except that it's basically accept this version of history or, or suffer, suffer the consequences. And the, no one in the room can object. The president of the college can't object. The students can't object because they're so dependent on donations from him okay. and his friends, right? And I think, um, and it's really interesting that the one time, Julian Carr, the one time he will admit the wars about slavery, and this is true of other Confederates at the time or former Confederates at the time, will admit the wars about slavery is when they're talking about how loyal slaves were. Mm -hmm. Which is, of course, another lie in and of itself, because we know that you know over 400,000 slaves run away by uh, what, 1864 uh, have run away. We have 200,000 um, African Americans who serve in the U.S. military. Mm -hmm. You have, you know, it's just the if North Carolina somebody needs to write a book. There's a book out there to be written that hopefully someone else will write or I'll write um, about the sort of contributions of African Americans to intelligence gathering. Mm -hmm. Right. Of uh, African Americans running away from slavery are constantly showing up at union lines and saying, this is what I saw on my way in. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think it's been underestimated how big of a contribution that is. But but anyways, this he he's wants the one time he'll talk about the cause of the war of slavery is when he'll talk about how loyal slaves are. And he'll say, even though they knew that the, the war was about them and that they'd be free if the union won, they stayed loyal. Right. And well, that's the one time. So. He'll change the cause of the war. He'll be like, oh yeah, the war was about slavery when we're talking about how loyal slaves are. Because when he rewrote the cause of the war, it wasn't to deny that he was racist. It wasn't to deny that Confederates were white supremacists. He believed Confederates were white supremacists. It was to deny that they had lost 
Well, right? Well, because if you fought for states' rights, then you didn't really lose because states' rights is still around. If you well, fought well, for well, slavery, well. then you lost. And so only later do you see this lie evolve into one where people say, oh, the Confederacy had nothing to do with white supremacy. If you had told Confederate veterans, Confederate veterans didn't believe in, in white supremacy, they would have like smacked you upside the head. Um, like literally, they would have been violent towards you in some cases because they were feminine, violent white supremacists. And in fact, Julian Carr used his so-called military service, which again, he exaggerated in his political campaigns. Um, so one more sort of you know misleading thing. Um, as his credential for how he was the best white supremacist. When he's running in the 1900 Senate primary, he's like, you can trust me because I served in the Confederate Army. That's the proof you need that I'm a white supremacist. Um, and so to him, the, the narrative of history he was pushing was tied to the political narrative he was pushing mm -hmm. and the agenda he was pushing and the societal agenda he was pushing. And so they're, to me, they're all intertwined is the way I find it is that at the same time as he's running on a platform of white supremacy, he's also running for uh, to expand pensions for white Southerners, Confederate pen Confederate pensions, which were only for whites, right? With very limited exceptions that I talk about in the uh, fourth chapter. But uh, so it's all tied together, right? Yeah. All of these yeah. sort of elements, all these lies, they all come back again and again to upholding white supremacy in some way. They're not just to celebrate his own actions.